Suppose you had a polygon in the Euclidean plane, and it's not regular or anything, and you label its edges with letters. Oh, and it's a billiard table, so a billiard ball can bounce around inside this polygon um, with angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And every time the ball bounces off of an edge, you hear a sound corresponding to that edge. So first we hear the sound for H, now we hear a different sound for G, and then E, and so on. And we just hear an infinite sequence of tones, and each tone corresponds to an edge of the billiard table that this ball is bouncing off of. The sequence goes on forever in the future and forever in the past. And we could have started the ball anywhere on the plane and heard a different sequence. Now suppose you couldn't see the billiard table anymore and you can just hear all this different music. Can you hear the shape? Can you figure out what the shape of the billiard table is just by hearing all this different music? So this is joint work with Moon Duchin, Vivica Erlandson, and Chris Leininger. So more precisely, um, we're asking if you're given the set of infinite edge itineraries of billiard trajectories. So that's um, these, by, these by infinite sequences, infinite future and infinite past of um, labels of edges. And by billiard trajectories, we mean trajectories of balls bouncing around in the polygon that do not hit vertices. There's no pockets. Um, and we call this set B of P, where P is the polygon, or the bounce spectrum of P. Um, and we're asking if we can find P up to similarity if we're given B of P. That's the question. So first, let's look at some early observations and previous results. Let's ask a um, simpler question first, um, and that is, can we find a linear transformation L that preserves billiard trajectories for some polygon P? So a polygon P and a linear transformation L so that when we apply L to P, it takes P to a new polygon and it takes the billiard trajectories on P to billiard trajectories on L of P. So if we just think about, you know, some really simple cases, we can get some intuition for this. So if we think, um, think about a square billiard table and think about the most obvious trajectory you can think of, all right, um, what will happen if we apply a linear transformation L? So the square is going to go to some parallelogram and here's the billiard trajectory I picked where it goes where it hits the midpoints of all the edges um, and we see here that the angles are not equal and so this is not a billiard trajectory so this pair P and L doesn't satisfy it doesn't answer the question I asked um, so what about instead if we took a square um, that's sent to a rectangle by a linear stretch um, so let's say we just stretched in the x direction by some factor a. Okay, so what do we think now? If we take some billiard trajectory in the square, do we think it's going to go to a billiard trajectory in the rectangle by this linear map? So from this picture, um, it would seem that it is sent to a billiard trajectory. So let's try to make this more precise. At points of reflection, a billiard trajectory has local symmetry. It has the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if this is outside the polygon, and here's our billiard trajectory, 
these two angles are the same and we have this line of symmetry. So how can we preserve this symmetry um, when we apply a linear transformation? How can we do that? So think about the eigendirections. The only possible eigendirections we could have that don't disrupt the symmetry is parallel and perpendicular to the edge. And so that might change the angle of incidence, but um, it will always still be equal to the angle of um, reflection. So indeed, we could find a whole polygon and a linear transformation such that the eigendirections of the linear transformation L are all parallel or perpendicular to all the edges of P. What does this look like? Anything like this will work. So some sort of polygon with all the angles, multiples of 90 degrees. And then L is just of the same form as what I've written above. It stretches in the X direction and it stretches in the Y direction. And this will preserve this angle of incidence and angle of reflection of every billiard trajectory and send it to a billiard trajectory. So more generally, two right angled and right angled means that all the angles are multiples of pi over two, two right angled polygons that are affinely related sound the same, as in they have the same bounce spectrum. So now we'll talk about previous results. In 2012, we have from Bobok and Trubetskoy that you can hear the shape of rational angled polygons. Okay, and rational angled means that all angles are rational multiples of pi. And the only exceptional case is the case that we saw above, so other than right angled polygons. And then we have Calderon, Coles, Davis, Lanier, and Oliveira in 2018, which were working at the same time as us. Um, and from the bounce spectrum, they can construct the angles and also figure out which edges are adjacent. And this is for all polygons, so not just rational angled, but all polygonal billiard tables. So what we wanted to do um, we would like to hear the ratios of the lengths as well. So what I mean is all the angles might be the same, um, but the lengths might be different and we would like to be able to hear the difference between this. And we would also like to handle irrational multiples of pi. So we're going to talk about the results next that we found. Um, and to do that, first we need to give a, precise, a little more precise definition by what we mean by bounce spectrum. So given a polygon P, B of P is defined by, first we cyclically label the edges of P by an ordered set of labels. And then, um, we let B of P be the set of bi-infinite and by bi-infinite I mean um, infinite future, infinite past sequences of labels that are realized as itineraries of billiard trajectories so again bi-infinite means the sequences go on forever in both directions. And if we have two polygons, so given P1 and P2, we say that they have the same bound spectrum, or BP1 equals BP2, if there exist labelings so that the two sets are equal on the nose. Okay, so now we can state our theorem. 
So again, this is with Moon, Vivica, Chris, and myself. Um, and so if the two bounce spectrums are equal, this is if and only if either the polygon P1 is similar to polygon P2, or both of them are right-angled polygons and they're affinely related. So that's the exceptional case that we saw earlier. Um, so now we'll look at the ideas in the proof. So the first idea is unfolding, because this is a billiards problem, but it's a little different than usual, so pay attention. Um, so if we have a polygonal billiard table, um, we can consider a slightly larger one, given by taking the polygonal billiard table and then a reflected copy of itself. And in this larger one, trajectories bounce around just like they usually do. Um, but if we consider this trajectory or a trajectory that goes through that line of symmetry, we see um, that when we fold the, the, polyg the larger polygon, it becomes the smaller polygon, um, and the trajectory is sent to a billiard trajectory in the smaller polygon. And so we can study the billiard dynamics on the larger polygon to understand the billiard dynamics on the smaller polygon. Okay, but now there's nothing really special about that one edge, so let's simultaneously do this to all the edges. Um, and so that looks like taking two copies of the polygon, one reflected, one not, um, and then identifying them along all the edges. Um, so another word for this is the double. And then we just flatten the double um, or fold it to get a single copy of our original polygon. And we notice that if we had a, a geodesic trajectory on the double that avoids all these cone points, which I'm going to call non-singular geodesic, when I fold, that's going to be sent to a billiard trajectory on the polygon. So everything that's dotted on the back would just become a solid line um, and it would just be flattened all onto that uh, to that polygon, um, the original polygon. And from here, um, we could study non-singular geodesics on the double now to understand the billiard dynamics on the polygon, um, but we want to make one more change. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. So what we're going to do is take a finite sheeted branch cover of this double and we branch over the points, the cone points. Um, and we do this to the point where all the cone angles of our finite sheeted branch cover are going to be bigger than 2 pi. And in this branch cover, the non-singular geodesics, again, are going to get sent to non-singular geodesics by the branch covering and then to billiard trajectory. So we can study the non-singular geodesics up in the branch cover or the unfolding. Um, so that's what an unfolding is, this um, branch cover of the double. We can study the non-singular geodesics there to understand the billiard trajectories down in our polygon. And the reason we do this, um, we do this finite sheeted covering, is so that we can have a non-positively curved space. So these are very nice to study, um, and, and that was our goal in taking the finite sheeted branch covering. So you might be thinking this is a little different from what I learned in unfolding is, um, if I'm a person that studies polygonal billiards. Um, and so I want to note here that usually unfoldings have a translation structure and this is used heavily in the study of rational angled polygons and polygonal billiards. Um, so here we sacrifice the translation structure and we do this in favor of a compact unfolding for any polygon. So, it, so even for irrational angled polygons, we now have a compact unfolding. It doesn't have a translation structure, but we have a compact unfolding, and that gives us a way to approach all polygons. So now we restate the problem from using what we just learned. So suppose 
that we have two polygons, P1 and P2. And suppose that their bounce spectra are equal. Okay, let's consider an unfolding U1 of P1. And U1 is tiled by copies of P1, isometric copies of P1. And this comes from the branch covering the unfolding construction that we saw earlier. And then let U2 be U1 after re-metrizing the tiles with the metric of P2. So why does this make sense? Um, right from the get-go, if the bounce spectra are equal, we can tell very quickly that P1 and P2 have the same number of sides. Um, so for example, maybe we have two pentagons or something, and the two pentagons have two different metrics. Um, and so if we take the pentagonal tiles of U1 and then give them a new metric so that they're now copies of P2, we get a new flat cone surface, um, and we're calling that U2. Okay, and so it turns out that U2 is an unfolding of P2. So let's take a look at why. So here's P1, and here's P2, and they're both pentagons, or they have the same number of sides in general, and we're thinking of having an identity map between them. It's the same underlying space, but it's two different metrics. And then we take an unfolding of P1, that's U1, and it's tiled by copies of P1, and now here's U2, um, which is tiled by copies of P2 in the combinatorially same way as U1 is tiled by copies of P1. So the tilings are combinatorially equivalent. These are, it's the same space with two different metrics, or we can think of it as homeomorphic branch covers. Um, and then here's, here's those tiles, right? So the, each tile is, they're in the same place, but they're shaped differently. Um, and so, so the branch covering is really a topological construction, um, and, and then the metric is separate from that. And so that's why U2 is going to be an unfolding of P2. It's also a branch covering of the double um, of a pentagon over those branch points in the exact same way. All we've done is re-metrized the tiles. So if we could show that U1 and U2 have the same metric, it would imply that P1 and P2 are isometric as well. By which I mean they have the same shape in the way I've been saying shape. So this makes us think about rigidity results for cone metrics. Um, and the most recent one was by Bankovic and Leininger in 2017. And they found that the marked length spectrum determines the metric. And this is for flat cone surfaces, which is what we're dealing with here. Surfaces that are flat, except for they have cone points with cone angles larger than two pi. So BP doesn't really give us the length spectrum. It doesn't give us that, no. So what can, what can we do? What does it give us? So we look back up here and now we start considering geodesics or billiard trajectories. So let's say we had a geodesic that didn't hit any cone points in U1. Then we fold it and under the folding map, it will go to a billiard trajectory in P1. And that has some bounce sequence, some, some itinerary of edges it hits. And now because the bounce spectra are equal, 
there has to be a trajectory in P2 that hits the edges in the same way. And then what we do is we lift that trajectory in the same way that the original geodesic um, is a lift of the trajectory in P1. So it'll go through the same tiles, the combinatorially same tiles in the same order. So what does this mean or can we rephrase this in a different way? So let's consider the universal covers now. So let's take the universal cover of U1 um, and, and then you know we think of it with another metric but um, it's the same space and here's the universal cover of U2. So this is not an isometry a priori. Um, and where, what we found is that here's the lift of gamma 1. Um, we found that if there's these two endpoints at infinity that bound a non-singular geodesic with respect to the first metric, then those same endpoints bound a non-singular geodesic in the second metric too. Um, and, and that's the lift of gamma 2 there that I've drawn. So let's write this down. BP tells us what pairs of points of the circle at infinity at the universal cover, um, which pairs bound non-singular geodesics. So let's make a definition that'll help us say this. Um, given a flat cone surface, so a surface with a metric that's flat everywhere except for cone points with cone angle more than 2 pi, we let g of s be the set of pairs of endpoints um, in S1 infinity that bound non-singular geodesics. And so in our setting, what we have is bp1 equals bp2 implies gu1 equals gu2. And so we want to get from GU1 equals GU2 to saying that U1 and U2 are isometric. And so this is what we did. So we have another theorem. Um, and it says that for a flat cone surface S, um, and we took it to be area 1 just to normalize. Again, all the cone angles are bigger than 2 pi. So if the holonomy on this flat cone surface is of order less than or equal to, then this set GS determines the metric up to SL to R action. Okay, and this is the exceptional case. The main, the main part of the theorem is that if not, GS determines the flat cone metric completely. Okay, so GU1 equals GU2 implies U1 and U2 are isometric, except for in this exceptional case. And this exceptional case matches up perfectly with the exceptional case that we saw with the polygonal billiard tables, the, um, the right-angled polygonal billiard tables. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about the ideas and the proof, but these two theorems are the main two theorems, and that's what I wanted to talk about in the talk. Um, so, for this theorem, let's say we had two flat cone surfaces, um, and let's say that they had the same GS. So we have S1 and S2, and GS1 equals GS2. Um, so first, there's some nice combinatorics, geometric ideas to get a bijection between the cone points of S1 and S2. And we're slowly going to build this up um, to a map on a one skeleton and then to a homeomorphism um, so that and then we're going to promote that map to an isometry that's the structure um, so we first get a bijection on the cone points and this is obvious in the billiard case for reasons that we talked about already um, but for the general case it takes a moment and then we triangulate with the cone points as the vertices and then we extend the bijection on the cone points to a map on the one skeleton. And we have to show that the triangles are sent to triangles. So what we don't want is a cone point to show up on the interior of a triangle in the second metric, for example. 
Um, but once we have that, now we can make it a PL map, a piecewise linear map, at where the pieces are the triangles, the interiors of the triangles. Um, and now we want to promote this piecewise linear map to an isometry. And, then it, and now it breaks into two cases. So for the irrational angles, we do a little more combinatorics and geometry, and we use families of parallel geodesics a fair bit also. Um, and then we're able to show that it has to be an isometry. Um, and in the case where we're dealing with rational cone angles, so when I say irrational angles and rational angles, I'm talking about the, the cone angles at the cone points. For rational angles, we use a theorem of Munduchen, Chris Meiner, and Kasser Rafi. Um, and that brings the whole thing together and we can show that S1 and S2 have to be isometric except for um, in the case where the holonomy is order less than or equal to and that's and that's built in um, to the rational case. So if you really want to see the details what you should do is check out our note on the archive um, and then that's it. Thanks so much for listening to my talk.